the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And our prayer for tonight is Psalm 20. The Lord answer you in time of distress. In the name of the God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary. From Zion be your support. May he remember you every offering. Graciously accept your burnt offering. Grant what is in your heart. Fulfill you every plan. May we shout for joy at your victory. Raise the banners in the name of our God. The Lord grant you every petition. Now I know that the Lord gives victory to his anointed. He will answer him from the holy heavens with a strong arm that brings victory. Some rely on chariots, others on horses, <clears throat> but we on the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we stand strong and firm. Lord, grant victory to the king. Answer when we call upon you. Almighty God, we ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon us that as we continue study of the book of Revelation, we'll always remember that you are fighting on our side and you are with us always until the end of times. We ask this to Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> so we finished chapter 16 last week. And just to remind you, chapter 16 was the pouring out of God's, of the balls of God's wrath. And that basically, we were talking about this liturgical action, basically. Because remember, the, this, ball, this ball of God's wrath are the the, it's like compared to the bowls of ashes that were left over from burnt offering. When an animal was burnt on the altar, they picked up the ashes and they ceremonially in the, in the procession carry it outside. They sprinkle some of the ashes on the people as an act of purification and then dispose the rest of the ashes into the garbage, you know, in, into the garbage disposal, whatever they, they were using, whatever they were throwing out. So this whole idea of you know, the God's wrath, it's a purification of the people. It's a purification of the entire world. And this purification is important. Why? Because God still is calling people to conversion, all the, all the, all the to the very end. So we need to remember that. that it's, it's not a punishment. God's wrath is not punishment. It's purification. And we're going to see that scene again and again. Just to remind you, I'm going to give you a lot of uh, reference to the Old Testament because today, because tonight, because I told you that at the very beginning. This book has 404 verses. 320 of those verses are citation from the Old Testament. Okay? None of them is verbatim, but they are, translated, they are citations from the Old Testament. That's the thunder. Yeah. In school, yeah. So you have to remember that this is, that's why it's so important to read your Bible so that you know your, your scriptures. Because they, refer, they, they you know, make references to things that we're not familiar with because we, don't, we do not read the Bible, unfortunately. And as, you know, that's why this book has so many strange interpretations. Because people will make anything out of this book because they, <clears throat> because they don't know the Bible. And they don't know what, what the, the author is referring to. And that's why it's so... Uh, discouraging and, and church did discourage reading of that book <clears throat> actually because of this book was the last one that made it to the canon and it only made it around the year 150 maybe maybe later than that so it wasn't the church was a little suspicious about it why because remember from the moment that the Saint Paul started baptizing the Gentiles those who are not Jews those people do not know Old Testament they don't read Hebrew, they don't read Old Testament, they might read Greek to read the Septuagint, but that's just, you know, they're starting doing that. So for them, reading this book was like, whoa, like for someone today that doesn't know anything of Old Testament. You can just, you just scare the crap out of you, right? Basically. But this whole idea is, you see, it, only later on, when, the, when they started studying Old Testament and learning about that, the church always discouraged reading of this book by, by, by yourself. They said, you need, to, you need a guide to read this book. And also, the uh, church was very clear that nobody should be reading that book unless you hit 30. So you under 30, you shouldn't be reading this book. Okay? <laughs> Why? Well, because you don't know much of the history of past. You don't know much of the Bible. And you don't have much of experience. So they were saying, you need all, all, of three, all three of those in order to get the message of this book. Okay? So, Chapter 17 is basically based on the vision of prophet Isaiah in chapter 23, Ezekiel in chapter 23 and 16, and prophet Nahum, chapter 3, which talks about the judgment day. The judgment day that God will come to judge his enemies. 
So let's go. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who is seated upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and with the vine of whose fornication the dwellers on earth have become drunk. And he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names, and it has seven heads and ten horns. Okay, let's look at those first three verses. So the verdict, you know, again, it was already pronounced twice in chapter 14 and 16, so this is the third time that the judgment is pronounced. And we see that, uh, again, we see that the wilderness, ref re it's reference to chapter 12. You know, in chapter 12, we had another woman that was dressed in fine linen and in sun and in moon and all that, and she was in the wilderness where she was fed by God. And she was carried to the, to the wilderness by an eagle, on eagle wings, right? Now we have a woman who is not fed by God, but who is getting drunk on the wine of her fornication. Of her, again, fornication usually stands for idolatry. So what is happening here? So someone who is not fed by God, but is getting drunk on their own designs, and who is sitting on, on a beast. Okay, so it's not eagle carrying her in the wilderness to protect her. She is in the wilderness because it's a place of, uh, let's say, what, do, what would wilderness stand for in Old Testament? Desert. Exodus, 40 days, 40 years. Times of purification. That's what, what it is. So wilderness stands for place where you know, all the demons dwell and uh, wild animals, but also it's a place where God is guiding his people to help them to be purified. Okay? So this, in this chapter we'll see a parody of God's action. Satan will be parodying God's action by trying to reverse it and also to, uh, let's say, to, to make them seem as if those things were coming from God. Because that's a parody will be. But we'll have a, always short, uh, fell short of, of the same results as God will produce. So let's go to that. Okay. So, and the beast again has, was full, the beast was full of blasphemous names, seven heads and ten horns. The beast stands for Rome. Why Rome? Full of blasphemous names. What will be the blasphemous names in Rome? Eternal city, divine, Augustus, all those things, all those blasphemous names. People and state make itself God-like, it becomes beast-like. That's the parody, that's the, that's the shortcoming that is coming out. Now we can, we can see that, again, you know, I live through communism, you know enough of history to, to talk about you know, the state that is trying to make itself God-like. It becomes the most abusive beast-like state. All the communist countries, all those things, that, that's exactly what become, you know, Nazis in, the, in World War II, the same thing. Why? Well, because you cannot take, replace God. Because when you replace God, then you become, you try to become God. You know, very often liberals in this country are like that, you know. We know better what, what is good for you and we, we will make you do it. Rather than you free, you know, God's way will be you free to do what you, what you know is good. You know, I will force you to be good. But is it, you have to be good my way, not your ways, my way, because my way is the only way. That's when we, when people, we become not human, but beast-like. See, that's what, that's, that's what hold this image of beast is so important because that's what we become. When we lose our humanity, we become beast-like, not animal-like, but beast-like. Okay? So it has seven heads and ten horns. Seven heads, the letter on this chapter, we'll be seeing the explanation of that. Rome was built on seven hills. Also could be reference to perfection. Why? Well, because, you know, Rome is a per perfect incarnation of evil that can, uh, that state can become. So that's why they could be used both ways. Okay? But it certainly refers to Rome because later on in this chapter he is talking about those seven hills, seven heads. Ten horns, again, a lot of power. Ten. Big number, less than seven though. Big number, <clears throat> but it's, so he has, that beast has a lot of power, a lot of strength. The woman was clothed in purple and scarlet 
and adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her fornication. And on her forehead was written a name of mystery, Babylon the Great, mother of harlots and of earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. All right. So you see the description of a woman compared to chapter 12. The woman, which is again this church that is being represented by a woman in chapter 12, when she's arrayed in sun and pure linen and moon under her feet and all that, and she's the one who is being fed by God, is a very peaceful image as opposed to this one, who is you know, a woman who is, which is, who is lavishly dressed in purple and scarlet, very expensive. You now remember that <clears throat> purple and scarlet was ma were made. Uh, the, the dye was made out of the snails that were only, you can find them on the, on the, what's today Israel, part of Israel. And only then, so it was a very lucrative uh, business and it was very expensive as a material. That's why only emperors and very rich people could wear purple and scarlet. Because it was difficult to buy this dye. So then we have golden cup. Again, that's reference to Jeremiah chapter 51, when he's a god when Babylon is being drunk on its abominations. So again, drinks from golden cup, what he drinks? The wrath of God, which means my sins are that I'm getting, let's say, carried on with myself, again, with my abomination, impurities, fornication, and so on, and that will affect me. My sins will be my own punishment. So that's basically what, is, what they're telling you. <clears throat> you, know, you see that, you know, let's say, uh, good example, drug users. You know, at the beginning, oh, alcohol. At the beginning, it's nice and everything is fine, right? Once you start getting into it more and more, it becomes its own punishment and you cannot quit. So this whole idea about that our sins becomes our punishment. They might taste good at the beginning. They might get you high, even you know, at the end, yet still they destroy you. So that's what he's saying, that their sins, her sins, the idolatry will destroy her. And she's drunk with the blood of the saints and blood of the martyrs. So you see, you spill blood, you will be, let's say, punished by losing your blood. Again, blood is life, remember that. So it's always blood belongs to God uh, as life. So that's, that's what, what he's telling them, that she, she kills the martyrs, she kills the saints, she kills the church, think, thinking that, you know, let's say, the Rome thinks that they can conquer Christianity or destroy Christianity by killing Christians. But what's happening there? Because of what's happening then, the Rome will, will lose in the long run because that blood will become like blood of Cain and like blood, blood of Abel that will bring God's justice into the world, into Rome. So when I saw her, I marveled greatly. But the angel said to me, he, to me, why marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. So you see, the beast that you saw, now you, you pay attention to that, was and is not, and is to ascend from the bottomless pit and go to perdition. So that reminds you of something. In chapter 2, when they describe God, who they describe God like I who was, who is, and who is to come, right? Here we have beast that was, that is not, and that will go to perdition. So you see the satanic parody here again. This is satanic twist on, on the truth. And, and the dwellers on earth whose name have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will marvel to behold the beast because it was and is not and is to come. Or better translation would be uh, was, is not and will be present. So this is again second time talking about that there will be the presence of that second beast at the judgment, of the beast at the judgment. But, the, but basically there is nothing that that beast stands for. Now, the dwellers of the earth that wonder about whose name is not written in the book of life. Remember, from the very beginning, he says in this, in this book, that the name of all the people, all the hu humans, are written in the book of life. So why he is telling here that there will be the ones who will not, whose name will not be written in the book of life. Because later on, remember chapter, that was chapter 11, I think, or 12. They you can blot out your name out of Book of Life by 
worshipping the beast, by carrying the number of the beast. You can blot out your name. So once you do that, then your name is not in the Book of Life. Okay? This call for a mind with wisdom. As you see now, the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman is seated. You have to know it's Rome, because that's how Rome is built. They are also, now this is kind of cool part, part here, seven kings, five of whom have fallen, one is, the other has not yet come, and when he comes, he must only remain a little while. All right? And then the next verse, as for the beast that was and is not, it is an eight, but it belongs to the seven, and it goes to perdition. Now, how much sense can you make out of that, those two sentences? <clears throat> again, you have to remember that again, this is a satanic parody of chapter 14, and this is the whole idea that's the number of the kings. So we see, oh, let me just skip this part. Seven kings. Seven, as again, it's a perfect number, but also original number of the emperors up till the time of, <coughs> of uh, let's say, Caesar Nero. He was the seventh one. So you have seven, which... Uh, seven could stand for completeness here. Why? Because, you know, he's telling them that the time of the beast of Rome is being completed. That's also another part. That's why the judgment has to come to her. And what will be the judgment? Well, the first, actually not first, but basically civil war that will you know, erupt after the death of Caesar Nero. Well, that will last for several years, when there will be three emperors at once trying to kill each other. That's why you have you know, the, the one that will come, the emperor that will unite Rome at the end, the eighth one, the, he really belongs to those seven because, again, he is, still will be judged by, uh, by the judgment of God. He still will fall under the, the judgment of God. So again, this whole idea about, you know, uh, let's say, the beast that was and is not, that goes to perdition. So the whole idea that no matter who will be on the throne of Rome, no matter who will be the emperor, the judgment is, has already passed. And that those emperors who will come after this, that emperor, because you remember, they, they, they go to up to number 10 early in this book. Here he's telling the eight is the one who will lead Rome into even greater sin, greater sinfulness. Why? Well, remember, from after Nero, every other emperor after Caesar Nero, after year 60, will do some persecution of Christians. So that's the judgment. You know, you killing the saints. So you being judged to not being worthy of being alive, of not being, let's say, to, you know, you, you are worthy to go to perdition, to judgment of God. So that's why you, you spell it with those numbers. That's one of the possibilities. The other one is he just got a little confused here. <laughs> and was kind of, I don't know what he was smoking or drinking, but... But, you know, basically, no, but basically, it's the whole idea about this, you know, he's telling that no matter what, how many emperors will come after, they already judged, and they're part of the perdition. They already belong to Satan. Why? Because they all persecute Christians. They all kill the saints. Okay? And the ten horns that you saw are the ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour, together with the beast. So all those ten kings are all the allies of Rome, who were not part of Roman Empire, but they were kind of associated with Rome. They were allies of Rome. But they, like for example, Herod the Great, you know, the sons of Herod, they were those kings that will be allies of Rome, but Rome will not control their territory. The Rom Romans will let them rule their territory by themselves. Unless they got really crazy, then Rome will intervene and take over the, uh, the territory, the, the state. So, and they receive authority. So it's not like, again, what's happening? God allows things to happen. That's, that's, what they, that's why he gives them authority to kill the Christians. But for how long? One hour. Just a brief time, just a short time. So it's not going to be three and a half days. It's not going to be ten days or seven days or whatever. Just one hour. So they have authority just for a very, very brief time. But it's given by God. So God is in charge. 
Remember, when, when he's writing to the community that is being persecuted, that is being killed, you know, the first question that they ask themselves is, okay, why me? Why us? Why does it happen? Where is God? Why doesn't God protect us? What he's telling them, God is sending that to purify your faith, but God is in charge. And in the end, if you're faithful, you're going to win. You're going to be crowned with the crown of martyrdom, which means probably they will kill you, but still you will win. That's the, that's the winning part. Why? Because you will be with God for all eternity. <coughs> so these are 13. These are of one mind and give over their power and authority to the beast. So you see, they ally themselves with Rome. They will make war on the Lamb, and the Lamb will win over them. For he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and those with him are called and chosen and faithful. You see, so those who are faithful, those who stand up for the faith are chosen, called, and faithful. Which means there's no chance, such a thing like chance, in their martyrdom. Everything is, God is in charge. What is interesting here, the Lord of lords and King of kings. Remember we talked about Gamatria earlier on. Gamatria, Hebrew letters have numeric values. Each, each, each letter has a numeric value. That's so why we can talk about number of the beast, 666 which comes to Caesar Nero. Now, here we have, if we count the number of letters, numbers, from the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, guess what will be the number? 777. Seven, seven, seven. And that's from Book of Deuteronomy, Book from, uh, and Prophet Isaiah as well. So this whole idea about, now we see, number of the beast is perfect imperfection. Number of the Jesus, the, the little lamb, is a perfection. So it's not short of perfection, it's perfection. 777. Seven, seven. And he said to me, the waters that you saw where the harlot is seated are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And the ten horns that you saw, they and the beast will hate the harlot. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. Okay. What is happening here? For God has put into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and giving over their royal power to the beast until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city which has dominion over the kings of the earth, over, or that reigns over the kings of the earth. So here we go. Where the evil ones that are united against good, God is allowing this to happen, but at the same time, this evil destroys itself. This is a day because why? Because those things, all those allies, all those people that are allied with Rome, they don't do that for the sake of making Rome greater. They do it to profit themselves. So in, in the end, they will destroy her. Again, this is, uh, greed is always the downfall of the empires, of the empires and the cities. And, you know, the, the people who that only use those cities, you know, it's always, uh, let's say, they in the long run destroy the empire, because they use it for their own purpose. Now we saw that, uh, where we saw that? Afghanistan, right? Iraq, right? All those who associated themselves with uh, US inva invading forces and so on. What was the end of, of the story? More war, more chaos, more destruction. And US did not really do well in those wars as well. Why? Because it was not really justified war in the long run. Maybe you know, it was kind of punishment and so on, but it wasn't a justified war, especially Iraq, and we paid a price for that. Morally as a country, you know, but also financially and everything else. So because the you know, US lost a lot of allies and a lot of uh, prestige in the world because of that war. So and amount of people that got killed and maimed and all the other things. So, see, when you don't do justice, when you, do, you don't pursue God's ways, there's always price to pay, and it's not a nice price to pay. Why? Because by doing evil, we do destroy ourselves. Sin is its own worst punishment. There's nothing else you can do. Why? Because it alienates us. Sin alienates us from God, from each other, and from the, from the nature. Right? They were reading a couple of weeks ago. That's what was happening. That's when we sin, we alienate ourselves. Because we think, okay, we, I can do it all on my own. 
And then once you own, you own your own, what's happened there? Oh, poor me. Why did it happen to me? Well, you want it, right? Okay. <clears throat> and the ten horns, so they will hold each other and so on. Chapter 18. Now, chapter 18 is mostly rendering of Isaiah 47. Isaiah 47 is a day of the judgment. And it's a basically climax of the judgment. So we will see right now, chapter 18, the, the real action of the final judgment. So the last scene before the coming of the kingdom, which is in a way also a reference to lamentation of Jeremiah and celebration of the judgment of the nations in Isaiah 13 and 23. Because it talks about affirmation of the faithfulness. It's not vindication, it's not revenge, it's justice being, being rendered. And it's also lament, lamentation over those people who are being punished. Why? Because they could, they had an opportunity to turn away from their sins, to repent, and they make choice not to. That's why they're dying. And you see, that's why this is also a reference to, <clears throat> to, Babylon, to Babylonian exile. Because when you look at the book of prophet Isaiah, look at uh, Amos and other prophets, they always say that Babylon was a tool that got used to punish the unfaithful Israelites. That was a tool to punish them so that their hearts can turn away from the idolatry and they can return to, to, to God. That was, that, that's what Babylonians were. The problem with Babylon was they became too arrogant. They thought that they're not, they, they, they're not a tool, that they are the tool maker. And for that, God destroyed them later on. He's using exactly the same, uh, let's say, dynamic writing in chapter 18 about the Babylon the Great. That's why he used the word Babylon, because it's not Rome. Well, it's Rome, but it's Babylon. It refers to the tool that God used to punish his people, to purify them, that became arrogant thought that it, be, that it was a tool maker and it was in charge. That's why it has to be destroyed. Okay. So after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. So it's not only an authority, great authority. And the earth was made bright with his splendor. So what is this brightness? Again, his splendor, because he comes from the presence of God. So when he comes from the presence of God, it's like Moses who was coming out to proclaim, to talk to Israelites after he talked to God. His face shone so that he, he, has, to, he has to put veil on it because it was so bright so that nobody could look at his face. So this angel, <clears throat> he doesn't have to cover his face, but his brightness of his face that's coming from the presence of God, it's enlightening the whole world. So what he says with a mighty voice, again, great authority, mighty voice. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. It has become a dwelling place of demons, a haunt of every foul spirit, a haunt of every foul and hateful beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of her pure, impure passion. And the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich with the wealth of her wantonness. So let's look at that. Fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. So we see this whole idea about a voice that is telling us what's really happening. And this fallen is, again, refers us to chapter 16 of this book, verse 17 and 19. So this basically, we go back. Remember, this is another description of the final judgment, but it's, uh, it's almost like a final description. That's why it's a little more intense. So the Babylon, which was, as we will see later on, Babylon, that woman who thought about herself as invincible, all-powerful and all that, becomes here a place of wilderness. Why? Because the dwelling place of demons, out of every foul spirit, every foul and hateful beast, that's wilderness. So it became the wilderness. So Rome became wilderness. So that's the place where the animals dwell, where uh, the spirits hunt and all the other things. And again, the wine of her impure passion, we talk about that, idolatry, and luxury and so on. Then I heard, okay, for a moment, you see impure passion. Yes, that's what, and again, it's all idea about who will, be, who will be mourning her or who will be sorry for her, the merchants of the earth. Why the merchants? Well, because they make no profit anymore. 
when the empire falls, what's happening? There's no profit. And there is no profit, it's a problem. Right? I could never understand that, you know, when, when, you, when you look at the things, you know, when, when they give you, like, uh, from Wall Street and others, you know, all the companies, every time they don't make any profits, they're talking about losses. I said, you didn't lose any money, you just didn't make any money. No, but for, for us, it's, I didn't make any money, which means I lost money. That's kind of, this is beyond my understanding of, uh, let's say, ec economy, put it that way. But, but that's, that's how we think as, as people, right? Because you invested yourself in doing something, and if you don't make many, any money, well, you lost. Even if you didn't lose any money, you still lost, right? No, you learned something. You didn't lose anything, you learned something. That's what I would look at, but what do we say? Okay, verse four. Then I heard another, another voice from the heavens saying, come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped up high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Render to her as she herself has rendered, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double draught for her in the cup she mixed. Three times double, right? So what is happening here? Jesus, another voice from heaven calling. So Jesus is calling his people, come out of her, my people, because you don't want to participate in her let's say you don't want to be tempted by her but you don't also want to be uh, punished by just by being in her midst so what is this is the whole thing about christianity that uh, at the beginning of the ch of the church's history the fathers of the church were always talking about christians being living in this world but not being of this world so that's what basically what he's what he's referring to here you live in this world but you have to leave this world you have you cannot be from this world you have to live in different reality. What's that reality? Baptism, kingdom of God. That's the reality that we're supposed to be living in. And again, how would the punishment will be? Give back to her as she herself was giving. Sin becomes punishment, which means you spill the blood of the saints, your blood will be spilled. And then he talks about this mix, a double draught for her in the cup she mixed. This is reference to a couple of places. Let me just see if I have it right. Yes, it's a book of Deuteronomy, chapter 32, 35. What was happening when a man accused a woman, his, his wife, of infidelity? They will bring her before the priest, so that he will go and uh, sweep some dust from the Ark of the Covenant, from the altar, mix it with water, and give it to the woman to drink. If she was guilty of adultery, it will be a poison. If she was not, if she was innocent, nothing will happen. Guess how many women died in that way? No, it was just to discourage men from stupid accusations, put it that way. <clears throat> but if the daughter of the high priest, we we'll see that book of Leviticus, was accused of uh, adultery, was accused of uh, immoral conduct, a molten lead will be put into a cup and she will have to drink that molten lead. And that will, be, that will be her end. Why? Because she was the daughter of the high priest. So she has to be spotless. So that's what he's referring here to. That she will be having this double of that molten lead of her, of her sin because she's found, she has, she's found guilty. So that's what will kill her. Okay? As she glorified herself and played the wanton, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, a queen I sit, I'm no widow, mourning I shall never see. So shall her plagues come in a single day, pestilence and mourning and famine, and shall be burned with fire, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. So this whole idea about her pride, arrogance, becomes her downfall. That's the, again, the empire that makes itself godlike, becomes beast-like, and that becomes also their, their fall, downfall. Why? Because now, what's happened when the emperor dies, who is proclaimed the Augustus, who is proclaimed divine? The people start thinking, oh, are gods mortal? Well, no, he just went to his forefathers, you know, he's ruling around from Olympus or from wherever the place, and he's, he's in charge. But the whole idea is, his, uh, let's say, the arrogance of the state, of any institution or state or humans that make themselves godlike, will be also the tool of punishment and their downfall. And we see that throughout the human history over and over again.
Okay, let me just finish here. And the kings of the earth who committed fornication and were wanton with her will weep and wail over her <clears throat> when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, in one hour has your judgment come. And the merchant of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of da da da, the whole, whole laundry list of what is the cargo of goods. You see here the, the, the dynamic here. You know, all those allies who were allied with, allied with Rome, allied with Rome, <clears throat> the only thing they, they want to do, stay away so that we don't get hit. Stay away. And what are they mourning? They're not mourning for the city. They're mourning for profit. No, no one buys, there is no profit. Greed, greed. Those people were driven by greed. And that was the fall of the city of Rome, but also the whole Roman Empire that was being built around it. Okay, let's take a break. Now, we're not going to go through that whole list, list of laundry list of catalog of goods. You can read it yourself. But again, everything is... You know, all those goods are luxury goods. The only thing that I want to touch on is the very last one, on the very end of chapter of verse 9. After the horses and chariot, they have also, they bring the slaves, that is human souls. So as you see, this is, even 2,000 years ago, they knew that, you know, we shouldn't be, let's say, slavery was, it's, a, it's destructive to human soul. It's not only the predation of human dignity, but it destroys human souls. Unfortunately, Christians didn't read this verse from the uh, book of Revelation. That's why we had slavery all the way till what, the 18th century, right? And, and, and a very unfortunate, uh, let's say, whole idea. But it's, again, why? Remember, we are created in image and likeness of God. So no human can own another human. That's the basic Bible uh, setting. That's what it is. You, you, carry, you are carrying dignity of God. Nobody can own you. Why? Because you are an image and likeness of God. So no human can own another human being. Because you are destroying the image of God. You cannot possess the human, human soul. And this also is reference to the book of prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel in chapter 27, verse 13, also talks about those who deal in human souls, who are going to perdition. Okay. So the merchant of the, verse 15, no, sorry, 14. The fruit, fruit of which you so craved has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost for you, never to be found again. So you see, the whole idea, what you were craving for, is taken away from you. And that's going to be worse punishment. Why? Because you cannot satisfy your desire for luxury, for riches. The merchant of these wares who gain wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas for the great city. So it's the second time we hear alas, alas for the great city. The third one will be in verse 19. So three times proclamation of lament or lamentation. Again, God does not want the destruction and the death of a sinner. God wants them to repent. So all those punishment, all those things that are happening, is to call them to repentance. Alas, alas for the great city that was clothed in fine linen, purple, scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and pearls. In one hour, all this wealth has laid waste. So how long you know, it took centuries to build the, the wealth? How fast it is gone? In one hour. Just like that. So that's how swift just punishment is. And all shipmaster and seafaring men, sailor, stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning. What city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads and they wept and mourned, crying, crying out, Alas, alas for the great city, where all who had ships in the sea grew rich by her wealth. In one hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven, O saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Here we go. So see, why they mourn her? Why they cry for her, lament her? Because there is no more profit. Because they grew rich on her, 
Now it's gone. What they're going to do with all those goods? Right? What they're going to sell them? Okay. And then we go verse 21. Now verse 21 is a reference to book of prophet Jeremiah chapter 51. When we talk about the destruction of Babylon. And it's exactly the same action. Then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great milestone and threw it into the sea saying, so shall Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and shall be found never ever. Your translation says probably no more, but a better translation would be never ever will be found. And we see that repeated how many times till the end of the chapter? There's no more. How many times is repeated? You count? It has to be seven. Why? Because it's a total destruction. It's a perfect destruction. So God is dis destroying everything. And what he is referring here again is to prophet Je Jeremiah talking again. Now, also could be referring to uh, prophets. I think Hosea was talking about that, but mostly Jeremiah and Isaiah. When they talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, when Assyrians were coming. So what is he telling? That it will be such a distraction that there will be no, and he did this exactly almost the same list out of seven things. No bride or groom, no sound of dancing, no sound of everything else. Everything will be destroyed. And yet at the end, God will restore Jerusalem, the fortune of Jerusalem. Here, God will punish the city. There will be no restoration. Why? Because there will be the heavenly Jerusalem coming down to earth. So no longer Rome, that was running the show. So God is promised, God is praised again here because he has defeated and judged the arrogance of the empire and he began his reign or his kingdom on earth. And we see that again because as we know, as we see here, it's the whole idea that if you remember chapter, what was that, chapter four, five, what was, what was the blood of the prophets and the saints crying from, beast, from, from the altar? Because it was under the altar. What were they crying? They were crying out for justice. So that those who killed them could be rendered culpable. So that they were crying out for justice. So now we have, what we have? Rejoice, because justice is done. And justice is being rendered. So we have that. Chapter 19. And now we have the praise of God. So we're coming to this place when they start singing, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. Because that's what it is. So let's see. After this, I heard what seemed to be the mighty voice of great multitude in heaven crying. Again, mighty voice of great multitude in heaven. Remember, those 144,000. That's the multitude in heaven. So who are they? The ones who gave their lives for their faith. Those are the martyrs. So they cry in heaven. What are they crying? What are they crying out? Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great harlot who corrupted the earth with her fornication and has avenged on her blood of his servants. So this is what they praise God. They praise God who is just. Why? <clears throat> because they suffered. And now they know that they did not suffer in vain. That God will punish those who were persecuting them. That's why they praise God for him being just. And once more, second time they cried. Hallelujah, the smoke from her goes up ever, forever and ever. Remember that's this whole idea about uh, chapter 11, right? When we, when, no, sorry, chapter 14, when I had the smoke of the torment that was lingering over, over the, you know, it was, didn't go to heaven like the smoke of the incense of the prayer of the saints. The smoke of her torment was like, you know, if you go to the <clears throat> uh, landfill and burn that. So the smoke is heavy, smelly, and it's kind of lingering. It doesn't go up. So that's what, what, that's what he's describing. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who is seated on the throne saying, Amen, Hallelujah. Three Hallelujah, three pr times praising God. Again, this is a superlative. God is praised in a perfect way. 
And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him small and great. Again, from the throne. Remember, from the throne, it's a proclamation of praise of God. And from the throne, who is sitting on the throne? God is sitting on the throne and he proclaims, Praise God, only God. Then I heard what seemed to be voice of great multitude again, like the sound of many waters and like the sound of mighty thunderbolts crying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. All right. So this is the final judgment, right? So what is praying? This is the fourth hallelujah. Why four hallelujahs? Because this is the praise God. Four always refers to the created world. So this is praise of God by all of the creation. And all, the, all of the creation praises God. And then we see the marriage of the Lamb has come. Marriage of the Lamb. What is that? Marriage supper of the Lamb. We celebrate that every Sunday. Eucharist. <clears throat> but also, Calvary. When did Jesus marry the church? Woman, this is your son. This is your mother. That's the, that's the you know, marriage. And out of his, his blood flows water and blood. See, that's the marriage of the Lamb. So this happened, marriage of the Lamb. How is Jesus marrying the church? By dying for her. That's how he marries her. He gives her, himself totally to the church. That's what marriage is. That's why we talk about indissolubility of marriage, right? That we're supposed to give each other, each other to mar in marriage totally. Okay? Because you don't own your life anymore. So this is, that, that's what the marriage of the Lamb is. Golgotha. But also, also judgment of, of God because on the cross, the whole world was judged. How? Well, by God telling them, this is how much I love you. You don't believe that you are lovable. You don't believe that you could be loved. And yet I'm, telling, I'm showing you how much I loved you. I give my life for you. That's the marriage love. That's the marriage vows in a way. I give my, my life to you. Okay? So that's the marriage, uh, supper of, uh, marriage feast of the Lamb. It's on the cross. And his bride has made herself ready. How is she make, make herself ready? By clothed with pure linen, as opposed to that harlot who was dressed in scarlet, scarlet and purple and all the jewels. The church, the bride of, of the Lamb, has a very simple garment. Why? Well, because it's a baptismal robe, white baptismal robe, pure, pure linen, bright and pure. And that, that linen, that, that garment is the deeds of the righteous. If you remember chapter 2 and 3, the seven letters, in every letter, the visionary, the, the angel was telling to the angels of the churches what he was telling them. I know your deeds. I know your deeds. Here we, have, we see that the deeds of the righteous are the pure dress of the church. So we will be judged by what we do. Why? Because with every sin, we're staining that pure garment of the church. There's no such a thing like individual sins. Every sins affect the whole community. That was what was he saying here. But every single sin of us, of ours, affects the entire church to some extent. Sometimes to bigger extent, sometimes to smaller, but always does affect the whole community. And so we have sacrament of healing, which we call confession. Why? To heal that wound, that, that stain, to wash that stain that was being done by, by sins. So again, no such a thing like individual sins. Verse 9, And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. So again, this is, if you remember, we're talking about the seven Beatitudes in this book, the very first class. So this is the most, the central beatitude. Blessed or happy are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. 
which means those of us who have Eucharist, who receive Eucharist, who participate in the Eucharist, that's the blessing that comes from the Eucharist. All these so-called churches that they don't have Eucharist, you know, they are not part of the supper of the Lamb, of marriage supper of the Lamb. Why? Because they don't receive the sacrifice. They don't celebrate the sacrifice. So only those churches that have Eucharist could be called churches. And now up to Vatican II, and later on, you know, even later, all the churches, all the what they call Protestant churches and others, which don't have Eucharist, were never called churches. They were called ecclesiastical bodies, they were called sects, they were called everything. Only with Vatican II, they started calling them churches, but they are not really churches. Church is, church is the community that celebrates the supper, the wedding supper of the Lamb. Eucharist. If you don't have Eucharist, you're not a church, no matter what, you, what you're saying, telling yourself. Which also reminds us how important the Eucharist is. Because we are Eucharistic people. Why? Because we celebrate. Every time we come to celebrate the Eucharist, we celebrate this judgment, but also God's love for us. And we celebrate our wedding with the Lamb. So that's how important it is. We remind ourselves that we are one with God by the celebration of the Eucharist. You know, we're receiving his body. You now, if you give someone your body, is that the consummation of marriage, right? You give someone your body, so that's what God is going to us. So we consume him, that's the consummation of the marriage, <clears throat> of, the, of this whole supper, marriage supper of the Lamb. So that's how important it is. It keeps us alive because it reminds us what we are and what our vows and who are we. Excuse me? Also valid, the Protestants? You have the no, no Protestant church has Eucharist. They don't believe in the real presence. None of them. They, do, so they call it. No, no. But they believe it's a Anglicans, Anglicans will have, yeah. but, uh, like but even you know, those mostly, most of Anglicans right now, they don't believe in the real presence. Mm -hmm. For them, it's just a symbol. Oh, okay. Like Lutherans and others, it's just a symbol. It's not a real presence. Mm -hmm. It's only Orthodox and Catholics that have, that have Eucharist, none others. Then I saw a heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. Now, do you remember another white horse that we talked about earlier? Yes, it was chapter 13, right? And who was this white horse in chapter 13? Well, it was Jesus coming on the message of the gospel. But maybe because we go to that now first, because from this moment on we'll see seven visions of the end. Okay? There's seven visions. He will have seven visions. So it goes like that. Chapter 19, verse 11 to 16, we hear about the return of Christ, the, the rider of the white horse. Verses 17 to 21 will be again another description of the last battle. Chapter 20, verse 1 to 3, We'll hear about the binding of Satan, the vision of the binding of Satan. Verse 4 to 6, the thousand years. That's another good thing to talk about. Then 7 to 10, war with Gog and Magog. Verse 11 and 15, that will be the last judgment. And then chapter 21, the whole chapter will be the vision of the new Jerusalem. So we have the sequence of visions. They're not necessarily chronological because they talk about the new creation. Remember, God creates the world in how many days? Seven days. So God is going to, six days, seven, he rests, right? So what the, what, that's what exactly is here, it's six plus one. Six times we hear the vision of God's judgment. So God creates new, God creates new world. And then the seven, the new, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem, that will be the place or the time of God's rest. Because God of the chapter 21 and 22, God will become everything for everyone in this heavenly Jerusalem. So that will be God's rest. He doesn't have to do anything more. Judgment is completed. The new creation is there. The new heavenly Jerusalem, God rests. Okay? So that, that's the sequence of those things. So heaven wide open. As we see, everything is white. And chapter 6, the white horse. And then the one who sat upon it is called faithful and true, and his righteousness he judges and makes war. All right. Faithful and true. Who is that? 
has to be Jesus. Well, if you go back to, again to chapter 6 and chapter 3, no sorry, 5, when we hear that the, who is the faithful and true witness, the one who died for, our, for us. Yeah? And in his righteousness he judges and makes war. I did not come to bring peace, remember that part? I came to bring war. A mother will be against daughter, daughter against mother, and so on and so forth. That's what he's talking about. That the message of the gospel, the white horse, will cause division, will cause the families to break apart, will cause people to denounce each other and kill each other. Why? Because people don't like the truth. People don't like the truth. And we see that in our world today. You know, try to tell truth to certain politicians, right? Those who lie, every, every word that they say is a lie, they hate the truth. See, that's, we don't, you know, if you live a lie, a life of a lie, so you're not going to like the truth. Why? Because it exposes you, makes you look foolish. It also shows you who you really are when your lies are exposed. So, if we don't learn from that, I don't know what we're going to learn from. His eyes are like flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name inscribed which no one knows but himself. Okay. Eyes like flame of fire. He is angry. Why is Jesus angry? He's angry at sin. He came to destroy sin. He came to destroy sat Satan. He's angry at sin. And on his head are many diadems. Remember, how many diadems did the beast have? Seven, right? Ten in one chapter, seven in the other one. How many has Jesus has? Many. You cannot even count that many. Okay? Which means what? He is the one, again, diadem stands for those kings or for power, earthly power. So he is the one who has all the power in the world. And has a name inscribed which no one knows but himself. What will be that name? That no one is, let's say, capable or willing to pronounce, even today, the Jewish people. God. Remember the holy name of God? God. Y-H-V-H? Okay, that they don't pronounce even, and we don't know how to pronounce it. This is the sacred name that Jesus has written on his forehead. Why? Because he is now one with God. He is the Lord. He is God as well. So that's his name. He is clothed in a robe, dipped in the blood, and the name by which he is called is the Word of God. John chapter 1. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So we know it's Jesus. And his robe is dipped in blood. So, it's probably his red color, although he's uh, wearing white. Why? Because if you wash your robes in the lamb, in the blood of the lamb, they become pure white as wool. So that's what he, what, what he does here. Okay? And the armies of heaven, wearing fine linen, white and pure, followed him on white horses. So now it's the whole let's say, heavenly army, all the saints, all the martyrs, are going on to proclaim the gospel. Because again, white horse, that stands for the message of the gospel. So what's happening there? By their death, they preach the gospel in the best way. Because if there is something that I'm, worth, I'm willing to die for, meaning that, that thing is really, really important. And I'm not, nobody's going to die for a lie. You die for the truth, you die for something that is really good. So that's what they, what they are. So they preach. And from his mouth issues a sharp sword with which to strike the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of God, wrath of God the Almighty. And on his robe and his tithe he has a name inscribed, again, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So he goes to the battle with big 777 written on the side and on his robe. So what's happening here? From his mouth issues a sharp sword. Again, the word of God. Yeah, that's the word, the word that he proclaims. That's the sharp sword. Why? Because the word of God, as letter to Hebrews said, it's a sharp sword that will separate sinew from bones. The word of God will reveal the real truth, the truth of our lives. 
and he shepherds them with the rod of iron. Remember, we, talking, we were talking last week about the rod of iron. It's an enthronement ceremony when the king who was being enthroned, the pottery with the names of enemies was put in front of him and he was, was to, to show that he has enough strength. He has to smash that pottery with this rod of iron. Okay, to show that he has strength to destroy all the enemies. And that's what Jesus does. He shepherds them, not with a shepherd's staff, but with a rod of iron. Why? He will destroy all of the enemies. And the last enemy destroyed is death. That's St. Paul. So it's, it's, you see that he refers to a lot of writings of New Testament as well here. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of wrath of God the Almighty. So we're back to chapter 14. When we talk about the uh, God's, the, of the wrath of God's, let's say the wine press of God, that was the that was the wrath of God uh, fury. What was that? Just to remind you, that think about that. Go back to this to the chapter 14. What 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 was that? Uh, let's say the wine press was standing for. What you do in wine press? You press the grapes so that the wine can come out. Which means you destroy something, grapes, to bring something greater. So the wine of God's wrath. God is allowing destruction of the life of his faithful, life of his son, so that something greater can come out of it. And what comes out of it? That through his blood, we have the redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And by our participation in that, our earthly lives become transformed and changed into, let's say, the wine that celebrates, that we use, is used to celebrate God's glory, to praise the Lord. So that's what, what he's writing here about. So this whole, again, this whole judgment that he's coming, that great war, is basically back to the Calvary. Because when was you know, his blood being poured over and spilled on Calvary? That's when the blood came out. Out of, out of his sight. <clears throat> and that's how he, how he saved us, through outpouring of his blood. So the last judgment, basically, already happened. Happened where? On the cross. And we'll see that in following verses, when we talk about the, the rest of this judgment. Verse 17. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come, gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, and so on and so forth, and the beast gathered. Great supper of God. What does it refer to? Come on. What is the supper of God? Eucharist, right? So this is basically, so this is basically a parody of the Eucharist. What do they gather to eat? The, the animals will gather to eat what? The flesh, not of God, but of those who were standing against God. Why? Remember, as sin, so the punishment. In previous chapters, we saw that how Satan was parodying God. You know, the parody of the Holy Trinity, of Mary, and all that. Now, God is telling Satan, if that's what you do, that's what you're going to get. So, the parody of the Eucharist will be that your flesh will be eaten, not mine. So you have means, which means the, the animals will eat the flesh, your flesh, your bones will be scattered all over the place, you will have no rest, but you will not be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb. So that will be the punishment. But God will allow their own sins to become their own punishment. They choose to parody God, to mock God, they will pay for that by being mocked themselves. Does it make sense? A little bit? Yeah, you know, if you don't, if you're looking for some, let's say, example of that in today's world, uh, you see that all the time when people, again, who live a lie, you know, this, what, did, this, what did destroy the communist system in, in Eastern Europe and Soviet Union? The lies. Because people saw what the truth was. And that's why when John Paul, John Paul II, when he was going, he always telling them, no, live in the truth. Do not be afraid. Okay? Don't participate in the great lie. And that's what was the end of it. 
and their own lies destroy them. Because that's what it is. You know, if we live by lie, guess what? It's going to destroy us. Once the truth comes out, you lose all the credibility and everything. So the first rule, as God was saying, remember the book of Deuteronomy, one of the, the biggest sin that God did, repeat, repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, that the greatest sin, do not lie, do not lie. The liars will never make it. Do not lie, do not lie. So it's a great thing, you know, just told for us. Do not lie. Okay, so we had all those armies. And the beast was captured, verse 20. And we did false prophets, who in his presence has worked the signs by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped the image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. And the rest was slain by sword of him who sits upon his horse, the sword that issues from his mouth. And all the birds were gorged with their flesh. That's a nice picture, I think. <laughs> well, see, this lake of fire, it's a reference to Daniel 7, when the enemies of God are being destroyed by being thrown to the lake of fire. So he uses this image from the book of Daniel. What is the book of Daniel talking about, chapter 7? The day of judgment, when God comes to judge the enemies. So we have the beast, and the this, and this first, second, and third beast, and the rest of those who did not repent. They are being slain by the word that comes from his mouth. Which means the truth will set you free. The truth will also expose your lies and will destroy you if you live in the lie. That's how they are destroyed. And that's why they are being destroyed by their own, let's say, creation. Because creation destroyed them, right? No, nobody else. So verse chapter 20. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, the ancient serpent, who is devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Great. So Satan is in prison for a thousand years. Why a thousand years? Long time. How long? A thousand years. Long time. Doesn't matter. It's not a mathematical number. It's just a big number. It's a big, so he will be, and let's say, imprisoned for a long time. Problem is, after this long time, he will be released again. Now, when did that binding of Satan happen? When Jesus bound the power of Satan at the cross. At the cross. So he's going back to Calvary. So once Jesus died, Satan is in prison. He has no longer power over us. Thousand years. But he's being let out for a thousand years again. Now, all those of us who are baptized, okay, we are living the reality of the kingdom of God. Then why do we sin still? Because Satan is out there deceiving us. That's a thousand years. So it's not like a thousand years after a thousand years, it's the same time. Satan is still has he has no power over us but he still has power to deceive and to lie. That's why we sin. You see, we are already living the reality of the kingdom of God after we are baptized, and still we mess up. Why? Well, because Satan is still roaming out there, tempting, and we fall for it. So that's what the meaning of thousand years is, okay? It's not that you have to wait till year 2000, that they were waiting, and all the others, and all those millennials, and so on. It's not about that. Remember, numbers are very symbolical in this book. So the whole idea that, you know, how long is it going to happen? Well, until the second coming. When would Jesus come the second time? No one knows the time or the hour, but only the Father. Jesus is telling us the same thing. First Christians thought that the second coming will happen tomorrow. St. Paul is writing to, to Corinthians, you know, don't get married because, you know, you're going to get married and the Christ will come and all that does have no sense because the coming is very soon. Well, guess what? He's not coming. He's not coming. So a thousand years. It's a long time. So we're still waiting. We're still waiting. We're still waiting for, to, for those thousand years to finish, to end up. But we're still living it. So it's a long time. It's not over yet. And Satan is still out there tempting us. Does it make sense? 
So when they talk about thousand years, that's what they're talking about, the reality that we live in. Then I saw thrones, verse 4, and seated on them were those to whom judgment was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark or the foreheads or their hands. They came to life and trained with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Beautiful. What is the first resurrection? Come on. How we begin our Christian life. Baptism. That's the first resurrection. We die to the world and we raise to new life in Christ. That is the first resurrection. Second resurrection will be the final one. The first one we are already part of. Because remember, we're dead to the world in baptism. And we live as children of God. Blessed and holy is he who shares in the first resurrection. Which means all the Christians. Over such, the second death has no power. But they, be, they, they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and they shall reign with him a thousand years. Over he, of him, second death has no power. What is the first death? Well, the, the one before first resurrection. Right. Yeah? Second death. When we die. Yeah. Death has no power over us letter to the Hebrews and Paul writings to all the churches. <clears throat> he, and the, if you go over to funeral liturgy, what we talk about, those who are asleep in Christ, that has no longer power over us as Christians. Why? Because that just became, let's say, transition into eternal glory. That's what, that's what this death is. So the second death has no power over us. For those who do not believe, the second death is a destruction because there is nothing there. They go to the judgment because they have chosen emptiness. Guess what, what the reward will be? Emptiness. They have chosen nothing. They have rejected God, have chosen nothing. The reward will be exactly that. Nothing. So that's the, this is called the tragedy of those who don't believe that you know, when they're dying. It's a lot of despair. Okay? In a couple of minutes, as we finish this, this part of thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended or completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are at the four corners of the earth, that is Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. All right. So Gog and Magog, reference to the book of Exodus and Deuteronomy. This whole idea of God's enemies and of his people become an instrument of justice. God is showing his people his holiness by punishing the arrogance of his and their enemies. So those are the Gog and Magog. In the book of Exodus, actually Gog is the, is the king of the country of Magog. As you know, this guy here, he always uses those things. So there are two enemies. It's not only the king, but also it's the country that is the, the enemy of the people of God. Rome, that's what it was. It was the emperor and the country. And also the book of Josh, Joshua chapter 11, there's also refer, re, uh, is reference to Gog and Magog as well. So what is happening there? Gog and Magog is the final battle. Remember, the final battle will take place on, we saw that before, Har Megiddo, Armageddon. That's where the final battle will happen. Which also on the other hand, on the other name is the Calvary. That's the final battle. So the number is like the, la like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. What is the beloved city? Jerusalem. Has to be Jerusalem, right? But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. Remember fire in the book of Kings that came from heaven that consumes them. Elijah that kills his enemy. Also could be reference to another fire coming from heaven that destroys our enemies. The power of the Holy Spirit. Do not think beforehand what you're going to say in your defense. 
the Holy Spirit will give you a reward that you will use to defend yourself. See, that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. Now, do not think beforehand, Holy Spirit will be the one who will give you the word, who will destroy the, the enemies. And the devil who, was deceived, who has deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and brimstone when the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. I think we can finish with that. Let me just go to that. So we have, once the thousand years is over, once the, the second coming is here, the final battle is being, uh, being fought, which is at the same time Calvary, but at the same time is the final destruction of the enemies. What will happen there? All that, where is your victory? As St. Paul will say, the death is destroyed, the beast, the political power, loses its power over Christians. Why? Because what they can do for you. If you live in the truth, they can, what they can do? They can kill you, but they cannot harm you, right? That's what, what St. Paul is telling you, telling us. And the Satan himself will lose all power. Why? Because at that moment, of the final judgment, when the, the whole earth will be judged, then the, the heaven and Jerusalem will, will come down and will be one with God. So remember, for the community that is being persecuted, is being killed, or the families are being killed and being persecuted. This is a consolation letter telling them, be faithful, do not be afraid, no, God is with you. And nothing happens by chance, everything is part of God's plan, so just trust. See, what better consolation you need, right? No, it brings you, it gives, gives you that you know, sense of, I would say, security, peace, in the midst of all the nonsense that is happening. So as you said, so John in his vision, or whatever he has vision, or let's say ecstatic celebration of the Eucharist, because it could be both, he has this faith that he wants to share with everybody, telling them from this sacrament, from this celebration, from this supper of the Lamb comes life. But also with life comes resurrection. It's not just life, it's a life everlasting and peace with God, heavenly Jerusalem. So that's why how he's trying to bring some trust, faith, and peace into their lives, but also to our lives. Because we might not, you know, go through persecution, although, you know, if you have to, working with people, to work with people who are anti-Christians or who are nasty or all the woke people and all the other things, you know, you're going to go through your own sense of compromising, right, and so on. But the whole thing is like, do not be afraid. See, that's, that's what, what he's saying. Okay? Make sense? All right, so we finish here, so we will finish next week. So what we're going to do, if you have any questions, <clears throat> we'll have, it's only two chapters, two and a half chapters left, so I, I will finish next week. And then we'll have questions, and then uh, I'll try to summarize the whole thing, so that, you know, as of now, I was taking things apart, verse by verse, so I need to put it together somehow, right? <laughs> So that you can walk home with full physical, okay, I know this, that might make sense together. It's not just taking it piece by piece, but we also kind of bring it together. Okay? Let's pray. Father, can we include the sure. lady that sits next to me? She fell and broke her hip. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. She had surgery on Monday. Oh, I see. Sorry to hear that. Okay, so let's pray for her and let's pray for all of us, all those who absent tonight and who are for different reasons but we pray for them and pray for ourselves that we will always trust in God who is always with us God who is our father and we pray our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming. Have a great week.